Good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's uh, great to be here at Appian World. Thank you to the team at Appian and our partners at Raboyo for inviting me to speak. It's, uh, it's great to be here in Washington. Uh, my name is Lionel Hill. I'm Group CTO at Pamira, which is a private equity firm. A little bit of background about who we are, which will maybe help contextualize what we talk about next. We're a global private equity firm. We're headquartered in London. Maybe you might have figured that out from the way I speak, but there we go. Uh, we're not the biggest, but we're also not the smallest. We have around about $85 billion worth of assets under management, which puts us roughly in the top 25 worldwide. We have a private equity business as well as a credit business. We have buyout funds and growth funds, and therefore we have stakes in about 75 different portfolio companies around the world. 50% of our invested capital is here in the United States. And our key investment sectors are in consumer, in healthcare, in services, and in technology, uh, which is lots of fun for me. So uh, we're going to take you on a journey today. I came on a journey yesterday from London to here, but we're going to try and take you on a journey a little bit after lunch, uh, which I'm sure you're all feeling very kind of relaxed and chilled out. Um, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, is the famous saying. Uh, but we're going to take you on a much longer journey than that. It's going to take you from the east coast of the UK. It'll take you to Menlo Park in California. It'll take you to London, Barcelona and Madrid. And we're going to do that to tell a story uh, about our generative AI journey over the last um, nine months. Um, for those of you who've already begun your journey on this topic, hopefully there'll be some useful notes for you to compare and maybe some resonances that you feel. For those of you yet to start, uh, this should hopefully give you a little bit of inspiration. Um, so in preparing for this presentation uh, about a month ago, I was going to do a whole theme around journey of a thousand miles beginning with a single step. Uh, but instead I found this chart from Gartner, which I think actually summarized our journey very, very well. So. A typical journey, according to Gartner, as far as generative AI is concerned, is there's a, a slow period of planning. It ramps up a little bit into experimentation. There's then a stabilization period. And then there's a pivotal moment. It's the kind of whether you're going to succeed with this initiative or not that happens. And then you go into expansion and leadership. So let's see where our journey takes us. Before I do that, just in the room, want to do a quick straw poll, which is how many people are already using in production generative AI in their enterprises today? Okay, so, and how many people are either not using it or thinking about using it? Okay, so the majority. So it's probably 80, 20, something like that. Good, well, hopefully there'll be some, some useful things in here for you. So, um, Let's take you on the first step of the journey. Picture the scene. You are in a typical village on the east coast of England. It has a pub. It has the ruins of a 12th century Benedictine monastery, which was ransacked by Henry VIII many, many years ago. And it's two miles from the North Sea coast. And it's June the 1st, and it's five minutes to six. And I'm on holiday, vacation, I think you would call it over here. Uh, and it's been a beautifully sunny day. The sun is shining, the bumblebees are buzzing in the lavenders, they smell amazing, and a light breeze is rustling through the garden, and you can hear the, the leaves on the trees, and I think, it's five to six. It's time for a gin and tonic. <laughs> and apologies if I'm getting you started too early in the day. I once did this presentation in the morning, and I think this bit was totally inappropriate. Anyway. So time for a gin and tonic to seal the perfect day. The ice and the lemon goes in, the gin's poured over the, the ice, it covers it, uh, and then the tonic's added and you can see the bubbles over the top of the glass. You guys all know what I mean. Uh, and I bring the drink to my lips, I can just, just smell it. And then all of a sudden, the phone rings. And I look at my phone and it's our uh, partner who runs our technology investment business in Menlo Park in California. It's probably, one minute to 10 his time. I don't think he's drinking gin and tonic. I think he's probably, I don't know, an oat milk latte or maybe something with vitamins or protein in, something like that. Uh, 
And anyway, so I pick up the phone and say, hey, how's it going? And he says, um, great. He said, uh, we've got our investor conference in 10 days time. And I was relatively new to the firm at that point. And I said, great, I'm really looking forward to it. It'd be our first, it'd be my first one that I ever attend. And he said, well, that's, that's terrific. We're really looking forward to you taking part. Um, we wonder if, uh, we're gonna talk a lot about generative AI at the investor conference. Um, could we have a working prototype by then? I said, what, that you want to demo at the actual conference to the actual investors? And he said, yeah, that would be fantastic. So can you get it done? And I said, sure, why not? So he said, great. He put the phone down and I thought, oh God, what have I just agreed to? Um, so anyway, the next phone call I make it's just gone six o'clock, is to my boss, who's based in Madrid. And I say, hey, Nacho, this is what I've just agreed to. And he said, well, you've got a bit of money in the budget for innovation, best of luck. <laughs> the next phone call I make is to uh, one of our partners at Raboyo, and I'm looking for a particular person. And I said, do you know where Phil might be? And he said, it's 20 past six on a Friday. Where do you think he's going to be? I said, oh, is he going to be at the pub? And he went, yeah. So I call Phil at the pub and I say, hey, Phil, we're really excited to do this thing. We want to do it in 10 days. Do you think it's possible? And he said, sure, we, we can do that. So over the course of the next day, I pull together the team. At 8.30 on a Monday, we have our sprint zero. And our sprint zero is analyze confidential and secure documents uh, using ChatGPT4. And we have to get it done in seven days by that point because we wasted the whole weekend just putting the team together. So what happened next? So a lot of you in here, I'm sure, are already Appian clients. Many of you may be prospective Appian clients. But we thought we'll use Appian as a front end because it's a fantastic tool for prototyping. And sure enough, by Monday lunchtime, we actually had a working front end, which was awesome. And then by Monday evening, we had kind of like a working system. It didn't work very well, it was a bit flaky. But anyway, little by little through the course of the week, probably by day four, we actually had something that pretty much fit, fitted the bill uh, that we wanted to, to use and show. And sure enough, the night before the AGM, we went around the cocktail party, we showed people the stuff, and so we achieved it. So working with Raboyo, we built an Appian front end, we connected all the things to Azure, so Azure Cognitive Services, Blob Storage, as your OpenAI chat GPT, really as simple and as vanilla as you could imagine. And we did it in seven days. And so this is what it looked like. I should have pointed out at the beginning, I'm, I'm an apologies. Um, I'm super happy if this is as interactive as you would like it to be. So there are microphones going around. If anybody has any questions at any point, please just either stick your hand up or interrupt or whatever you want to do. So, uh, this is the architecture of what we built. It's actually pretty simple, but there are three key things that I want to point out. So, first of all, there's the Appian front end, and we use that just because we could do it so quickly, and because through Raboyo we had the skills that were able to do that. The second thing, and this is the thing that we're gonna keep coming back to throughout the whole presentation. This is the data store here, so it says Pamira Data for Gaia, and you can see that it's connected through to all of our data stores. It's not really connected at this stage. What we really did is we took a whole bunch of documents from here, our SharePoint environment, and just copied them into there. And we took documents that we knew it was safe for everybody to see. And that will also be a recurring theme throughout this whole presentation. So hold that thought. And then the last thing is here, which isn't a very great logo, but that logo says it's a brain and it says Azure Cognitive Services. And Azure Cognitive Services gives you all kinds of pre-processing capability, uh, allows you to build a kind of small vector database. And that makes the operation of this bit, which is OpenAI and the LLM layer, really super efficient. So as you can see, Appian with all of its out of the box integrations, all of the Azure thing all working together, it's actually a pretty super simple uh, environment to build. Seven days, and I guess less than $15,000, $20,000. So nice and cheap. So we learned a ton of lessons. And I guess the first lesson that we've learned is you learn an awful lot more by doing than you do by thinking about it. 
So those of you who put your hands up at the beginning who said that you're already working on this will hopefully be able to attest to that. And those of you who are still thinking about it, the sooner you get your hands on this and play with it, the more you'll learn. So um, let's go through the things that we already knew. Security, and this is back in the day, and I know that Appian have got some great announcements about secure uh, access to LLMs and so on, but security back in the day, back in the day being June, July last year, was only really easily achievable using the Azure stack and using access to OpenAI. Uh, as basic as it was, we already had the intention to build the architecture to be as flexible as possible. And in particular, what we wanted to ensure was, whilst OpenAI was really the only game in town this time last year, we knew that there were going to be more LLM. So we had to build everything kind of as an independent component that you'd be able to swap things in and out of easily. And then other key risks that we were already seeing were hallucination risks. So not a great term. Not everybody likes the term hallucinations, but it's essentially when uh, OpenAI makes things up rather than tells you true stuff, because essentially it's a probabilistic model. So it does that. And there are ways to tune that to reduce the risk of that to be as small as possible. Copyright, I imagine, will be one of the big stories, if not of this year, or but certainly of next year, as people start to realize that essentially all of this thing really does is it copies information that already exists potentially to somebody else. So those are things that we already knew, but new things that we learned. We managed uh, with Microsoft to get our hands on GPT-4 for the prototype. It was a little bit kind of um, sketchy. We had to twist arms and plead and all kinds of things like that. But we got it, but then we were horrified to find that, uh, and again, this is back in July, it was 60 times more expensive than GPT 3.5, and it was slower. So, uh, wow, that was kind of amazing and changed the dynamics of the potential business case quite significantly. However, what we also found was you can mitigate the cost of the LLM through really smart, <coughs> prompt engineering and pre-processing. So the Azure Cognitive Services bit that we talked about previously. So you can do tons of the work in there, and that means you have less load to put on the LLM. So there are these things called tokens. I've no idea what they really are, but you spend tokens every time you put a prompt in there, right? Nobody knows what they are. Nobody can explain it. But anyway, there's a bunch of tokens every time, and you can reduce your overall amount of tokens that you spend by pre-processing. And then remember that I said that the document store, the way that we built that, we copied a bunch of documents from SharePoint and we made it as simple as possible. Well, data permissions are always going to be the hardest problem to solve in any of these projects. So literally, if you put anything in there, it's discoverable by anyone. So if you put in pay slips in there, everybody's salary will be discoverable to everyone. If you put in health records in there, everybody's health records will be discoverable by everybody. And so you need to be super, super careful about how you think about this. And we've done a lot of thinking about that. That's the single biggest problem that we, we've encountered on our journey. So we like to summarize our lessons learned by saying, the things that we thought were hard were actually really easy. So getting LLMs to work, getting really cool results to come out, getting kind of nice things, nice predictions, nice summarizations, all of that stuff, piece of cake. The stuff that we thought was gonna be easy, which was feeding it with data that was clean and that had permissions and everything, is actually the hardest part. And so that was what we learned. So that's the end of our, if you think about the Gartner curve, that's the end of our experimentation phase. And people were pretty excited by it. So the next chapter in our journey takes us to London, our office in London at Primero. We're very lucky, it's just around the corner from Buckingham Palace. And um, we're going to go to the Exco meeting where we presented our proposal for investment in generative AI and um, to convert our prototype into a working product. It's the 1st of August. It's another beautifully sunny day. Um, so picture the scene. All the senior partners are either in the room or they're in the meeting via Zoom and they're connecting from the four corners of the world and this intense debate is taking place. And there are two factions, there are two groups. One camp is absolutely adamant that the adoption of these tools is critically important for the future of the firm. And that we should proceed without delay and that we should go ahead and invest. The other is really, really deeply concerned 
that too much automation of what we do, and particularly the kind of the key business processes, will erode what we call our apprenticeship model. So in a private equity firm, people join as associates from kind of MBA level, and they learn to do leverage buyout models and all this kind of stuff in Excel, but actually the idea is that they should be able to write these things on a napkin in a restaurant at dinner or a lunch with a client. So a lot of the guys are really, really nervous that bringing in all of this automation is going to completely kill that apprenticeship model. Um, and of course, they're both right. They're both right. We have to embrace this, but at the same time, we have to be really thoughtful about how we deploy it and we have to maintain the, the apprenticeship model. So we square the circle the following ways. That, and this is our managing partner said this. He said, we're going to go ahead and do this, but our objective in doing this project is to learn as much as we possibly can about this new technology. And we want to learn about it from three dimensions. So the first is, as an investor, when we're looking at new companies to potentially invest in, how generative AI is working for them, how it could potentially work for them. The second is we're going to look at it from an owner perspective. So once somebody is part of our portfolio, how do we help them create value in their enterprise by deploying generative AI? And then the third, which is obviously my responsibility, is how do we maximize our effectiveness, our efficiency, our productivity as a firm by deploying these tools within the company? So this is what we did. Uh, we essentially had multiple work streams, three in fact. The first was to build our own product, so building on the prototype that we just looked at, and we gave it a name, which was Gaia, which stands for Generative AI Assistant. That was probably my biggest contribution to the project. It was coming up with a name. Everybody will tell you that as well. Um, and then we looked at some external high-end products, particularly tailored for private equity, and we chose one called Hebia, and Hebia is a great tool. We've got a great partnership with that company. And then the third is to, uh, to make use of M365 Copilot as soon as we felt, as soon as it was available, because this conversation was taking place in August, so it wasn't available to everybody at that time, and as soon as it becomes safe to use. And that's back to the whole documents and permission question. And we can talk about that more in the bar later. I'm not going to really talk about Copilot much today. Okay, so what were the challenges? The challenges were the creation of correctly permissioned data stores that can be indexed safely and compliantly, which means that people can only search against stuff that they are entitled to see, that they only get responses that make sense in the context of what they're allowed to see. And we selected SharePoint and OneDrive as kind of our, our unified data store. We'd moved everything to the cloud earlier in the year, so well done us. Um, and then we are working with a company called Veronis who uh, have made their name in data leakage prevention, but essentially to do automated tagging, to look at minimizing access to uh, documents and, and managing that permission in an as automated way as possible. One of our big use cases is call transcription. So we have a lot of calls ourselves, as I'm sure everybody does, but particularly when we're about to make an investment, what we tend to do, let's say we're buying a technology firm, is we end up calling, or we, through a third party call, maybe several hundred CTOs, so people like yourselves in the room, and say, what do you think about product X? And then you tell us all about product X, and then the way that currently works, or the way that has historically worked, is the analyst takes all of that document information and synthesizes what people feel about the product in reality. Now, what happens uh, with the best will in the world is that humans are humans, the incentives that uh, exist within a private equity firm favor people getting deals done. And so there's a lot of confirmation bias in when those analysts read those reports because they're looking for things that actually confirm their thesis. And we think that there's a fantastic way to complement that by looking at this type of technology to give a completely objective analysis free of bias on those types of topics. And then the third challenge was to drive adoption of standard use cases, but also unlocking what we call high value complex use cases. So here's, uh, here's Gaia. Gaia is born. It was uh, productized within, I'd say, two months. So we spent less than 20 on the prototype. We spent less than 100 getting to MVP. Um, we had a small dev team, so that was a new thing for Premiere. We'd never had a, a, our own dev team before. And 
the key thing that we enabled, which was a function that everybody really appreciated was in order to deal with document permissions, what we didn't do is we didn't give access to a whole big document store, but what we would allow you to do is to upload documents in runtime, to index them in runtime, and for you to then be able to query across those documents, a bit like chat PDF, but in a completely secure way. And then when you log out and disconnect, all of that indexing, everything else kind of disappears. So it's a non-persistent index. There's a little bit of startup friction. It might take 10 seconds for you to index 10 doc or five documents or something like that. But it's a super, super safe way of being able to do that kind of thing. And now you can see the Appian front end. Uh, and we came up with quite a cool logo. So Gaia, I just wanted, this isn't really kind of anything to do with the presentation per se, but when you're thinking about putting your business case together for this, here are a number of unexpected things that happened which we did not put in the business case, but have generated genuine value to us as an organization. So I'll go from one o'clock and go all the way around clockwise. So we've shared all of our experiences with all of our CIOs in the portfolio companies. And that's been a fantastic uh, experience for us talking to those guys who are similarly to youth, either thinking about it or already on the journey. And we've had something to give back to them in terms of learnings through this process, which has been super valuable has helped build those relationships a lot, a lot better with the portfolio CIOs. Uh, I know this sounds corny maybe uh, to some of you in the room, but as an internal IT team, we've never had anything that we could brand and market internally, and now we do. And that's gone down incredibly well. And that's actually contributed to really improving the MPS of IT within the firm. And again, that would never have gone on a business case presentation for doing this but it's genuinely been a huge advantage for us. We've built a critical piece of data infrastructure as part of this that can be redeployed for other AI and ML applications. So you can API into the back end of Gaia. And so we'll talk later about how you might use that with applications such as Appian workflows, for example. Um, it's giving us external marketing opportunities. Here I am, thank you again for the invitation. Uh, to talk about kind of stuff that we're doing and to grow awareness of, of the firm generally. Our teams have been absolutely delighted to learn new stuff. So whether it's DevOps, whether it's around AI ML, whether it's around this type of stuff. So it's been really energizing for the teams. And I think we've learned more about Gen AI through doing Gaia than any of the other products because we've had to get inside uh, the actual tooling. And of course I would say this, I think we're ahead of the majority of our competitors on this topic. Maybe not, maybe as far as we were at Christmas time, but still pretty good. So if you're wondering about building the business case, if you think it's marginal, there's all kinds of other things that you'll get out of this by doing this project. So last thing around the stabilization phase of this project. This seems a little bit abstract perhaps. So as we started to learn about this technology, what we noticed is some people were getting really good answers and some people were getting really poor answers out of the tool and we were wondering why. Uh, so the next part of the journey I'm gonna take you on is I'm gonna take you to Barcelona. And Barcelona on the Mediterranean Sea in Spain and it's the Gartner Symposium. In Europe, the Gartner Symposium happens in Barcelona, beautiful city. It's early November and guess what? It's another beautiful sunny day. Um, the early morning sun's rising over the Mediterranean. It's glittering on the sea. In the background, I can see, I think the America's Cup is in Barcelona this year. So for those of you who are sailing fans, you could see in the background, you could see, I think it was Ineos and Prada were practicing and they're on their foils 50 miles an hour. Amazing stuff. Uh, but I was there to meet uh, a colleague uh, from EY uh, and I'd spoken to, to him uh, a week or two before and he had come up with what I would say is a simple, smart, and completely costless way to make the outputs of generative AI better. And I wanted to talk to him about this a little bit more. And he said to me, it's a bit like user stories in Agile. There's a syntax to these things. You can write average prompts and they give you average answers or variable answers, but you can write better prompts and they will give you better answers. And he said, and Furthermore, he said, I've codified it so I can explain to you how it works. So here's 
how it is. So here's a basic prompt. Give me the most relevant indicators to measure the health of the startup. Okay, it's kind of an interesting prompt from a private equity point of view, perhaps. And it will give you some kind of answer, depending on the GPT, depending version, depending on the day of the week, depending on all kinds of things. But a much better question, which is basically asking the same thing, is this. As a financial analyst working for a global private equity firm, give me the most relevant indicators to measure the health of a startup using relevant financial KPIs. Um, include the following introduction. Some relevant KPIs for startups are respond in a five point bullet format using a knowledgeable tone. The output is to be used in a presentation with the firm's X code. So it feels like a lot more effort, but it's a lot more context. I, I remember listening to a podcast saying, Imagine ChatGPT is the hardest working but least experienced intern you've ever had. And they'll literally do anything and they'll literally work super, super hard, but you have to give them all the context because they're really quite dumb in that respect. So, uh, interesting, but then, and apologies for the colors, this is how he broke it down. And I think this is absolutely fascinating. So the basic prompt is just the task. Okay, so in red is just the task. And obviously you have to give the LLM a task, otherwise it doesn't know what to do. But then all of the other stuff, and you don't have to put everything in. Some of it is mandatory, some of it is important, some of it is nice to have. So here you have the persona as a financial analyst working for a private equity firm. You have the task again. You give it an example, because that really helps when it's trying to give an answer back. You give it an example of what you want. Uh, there's a format, include the following introduction, some relevant KPIs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Five point bullet format, a tone. You can see I didn't really think too hard about that one, so uh, that was there. And then the context, the output is to be used in a presentation. And of course, when you try those two prompts in any LLM that you try, the second one will give you a far better answer. But what we really like is this taxonomy and this is how we're starting to train people. And essentially, this is a, a completely costless, free way of improving the outputs that you get. Now, there's a, another way to improve the outputs that you get, which is more expensive and more technical, which is you then also create an internal vector based database of all the relevant information that you have in your organization. And we're doing that as well. But this is really cool and really simple and really easy. And so as part of a prototype, I think this would be something that we would have put earlier on in the process if we thought about it or been able to steal the idea from somebody earlier. So that's the end of our stabilization phase. We're now going to go through that pivotal moment about, well, is this really going to stick as a technology in Pamira or not? How are we going to expand the use of it and so we're going to go into expansion and I'm going to go through with you in the last 10 minutes or so some of the high value complex use cases that we're working on. And these slides are quite wordy, um, but you'll notice that on the left hand side, they're just prompts and those prompts are inspired by that prompt syntax that we looked at before. So the last part of our journey takes us to Madrid. Uh, Madrid is the capital of Spain. Uh, vibrant culture, wonderful restaurants, although they only open in the evening at about 8.45, 9 o'clock. So if you want kind of dinner at 7 o'clock, you can forget about it. You have to wait uh, a little while. That's the Spanish culture. And it's early January. And guess what? It's not a beautiful sunny day at all. But uh, I'm there with my head of enterprise architecture, who's a guy called Joaquin. Uh, and we're kind of wondering how far we can take the syntax of prompts idea. So one of the holy grails that Pamira has always talked about is uh, they've always wanted to pursue unlocking all of the treasures that might exist in the 20 years worth of documents and unstructured data that exist in the firm. Most companies are the same. You've got tons and tons and tons of documents with all kinds of information in there. And in there, there's some gold for sure. So uh, how do we access this 20 years of information all locked up in PowerPoints and Words and PDFs and Excels and so on. Can we elaborate the prompts further to take the next step? And the answer is that we can. So uh, this is a prompt. So this is literally what you type in. 
to the system. Please compile a detailed summary of annual gross profit from these documents sorted by year. And then you say that you want a JSON format. And then you even kind of say how you want the data to be formatted. And then you even give it some kind of categorization data that it needs to add to it. And that's the output. So that's awesome. So all of this years and years of wondering how do we extract structured data out of unstructured documents. And yes, you could use all kinds of smart document technology and OCR and all kinds of amazing things. And or you could use this. So this is very cool. The big challenge that you have with this approach is how do you do it at scale? So we don't have massive scale in terms of technology as an organization, uh, but still 8,000 deal folders in SharePoint, this kind of thing, scanning through those is still a mighty task for a generative AI tool. Um, our, one of the products we use heavier is capable of doing that. But imagine if you had a platform that could automate and orchestrate the execution of these prompts. And of course, Appian is something that can help you do that. So this is an interesting idea that we're starting to think about. Can you automate using these types of prompts, some kind of data mining approach, using workflow tools, using what we've built in the back end, using, I'm sure, the native tooling that's coming along. So that's cool. So here's a, here's a similar but slightly different version of what we looked at. So previous one was stripping data out of documents. This is almost creating data, if you like. So this is applying classifiers to unstructured data. So this is a basic example. This is sentiment analysis. So you can look at an investment memo and you can say, what's the sentiment that's being expressed in the in investment memo? You explain how you want it to look. So I've given it four things. So it can be optimistic or cautiously optimistic or pessimistic or draconian. I was having a particularly, uh, whatever, a poetic day that day. Um, and then optional pro provide a two sentence explanation. Could be a two paragraph explanation. You can ask for whatever you like. So here are the example out outputs. Optimistic, the deal team expresses strong conviction in company A uh, in their leadership position, its ability to sustain growth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The next one's cautiously optimistic. So you can start to use this technology to apply classifiers to unstructured data with literally anything that you want. So we talked about bias earlier. So we think thinking about different types of cognitive bias might be interesting. Anyone who's interested in HR in the room, might it be interesting to look at all of the annual performance appraisals and start to analyze the bias that takes place in those from different reviewers, different reviewees, different locations, et cetera, et cetera. Really anything is possible, I think, with this in terms of applying classifiers to unstructured data. And then lastly, and then please do ask some questions. Uh, um, how do you start to automate all of this stuff? So in Appian applications themselves, we have workflows that are um, case management types of things. I think it's a classic workflow in Appian, or uh, we have workflows where we have approval cycles that go all the way through and different documents are attached at different places. So how would it be if at different points in the Appian workflow, we made a call out through the API back to our generative AI tools and started to either classify some of the information in there or strip out structured data in an automated way, which currently is done kind of semi-manually. So really very interesting. So in conclusion, we hope the journey of a thousand miles has inspired you. So this is a little bit of where we are at the moment. So just to remind you, experimentation took us around about three weeks, was less than $20,000. The stabilization period was three months. So we got to MVP, spent about 100K. We've spent obviously more since then on building the product up. And expansion, we have a business plan for the next three quarters. And we're currently just about there. So we're part way through this expansion piece. So key lessons to reiterate. If you're starting on the journey, start small. So we had grand visions of, uh, can you create a eighth investment committee member that's actually a generative AI bot. It's like, I'm sure we can, but probably not this week. It'll probably take a while. And when you think about all of the things that we've looked at, it's probably the different Lego bricks of 
classifying stuff, of extracting data and, and trying to orchestrate that all in real time, that it's going to take us to do that. And it's going to take some serious uh, involvement from business experts in making that happen. Start small because actually the simple use cases will generate a ton of value for you. So we launched uh, our MVP product and within the first week, I remember I had a great conversation with one of our junior people from marketing. She said, oh, I absolutely love Gaia. I said, oh, really? I, I didn't know that you'd started to use it. She said, yeah, we actually wrote our most recent press release using Gaia. I said, well, how did you do that? She said, well, I loaded up the three previous press releases and the CV of the person that we've just hired. And I said, give me the press release that says this person has just joined the company. And she said it was more or less perfect. I said, wow, so how did you do that before? She said, well, we would send it off to the agency. It would take two days. It would be wrong. We'd have to iterate it. She said, now we can do it all in an afternoon. So we had never put that in the, in the uh, business case. We never imagined, I'd say, 90% of the ways that people are using this tool. So you will get huge value from these small use cases, and you'll get a ton of excitement as well, and a load of other stuff that you never banked on. Um, follow the value curve. I think this is a really useful model uh, to essentially kind of start small, uh, build up step by step, and get into increasingly high uh, and more complex use cases. And above all, have fun with it, and learn as much as you can. Uh, this is transformational technology, and I think you need to embrace it. Uh, and I think you need to get stuck into it as quickly as you possibly can. So, uh, before I say thank you to the team at Raboyo, are there any questions from the audience? Don't be shy. In the UK, we tend to think of uh, people in the US as being extremely confident and kind of outward going. <laughs> so, so don't make me go home and say, I did this presentation to all of these, and nobody asked a question. Ah, oh, thank you very much, sir. Oh, there's a microphone. Yes. So the, the question is, I'm not sure if the mic picked that up, uh, was that version 4 of GPT was more expensive than 3.5? Did it give us better results? That's kind of... So the answer is yes, uh, and subsequent versions have got even better. One of the things that's interesting to, to us is what we call multimodal search. So all of the versions since 3.5 have been really good at text, but when you start to look at charts and tables and that kind of stuff, that's where ChatGPT4 really comes into its own. It's subsequently got cheaper since the, that slide was first done, and there's obviously a new version of GPT coming along. Uh, and each of the subsequent versions will get better at this multimodal piece. Uh, Gemini is quite interesting. So Gemini wasn't anything that we were talking about until around December time. And Gemini is particularly good at the multimodal piece. So we've recently done uh, a piece of work where uh, we, we did a, a market map where the input data was almost exclusively logos and tables. And it could work out from the logos who everybody was. So that's very cool. So I think. Each subsequent one comes out as slightly more expensive. The more there's competition between OpenAI and Google and other providers, that will drive the cost down. I think you just have to be thoughtful about how much you send to the LLM, because that's the token bit that costs you money. And the more pre-processing you do, the cheaper that will be. Thank you. Uh, my compliments on the presentation. Well done. Thank In you. terms of... Uh, have you seen have you seen our executive order that was published about like two weeks ago? Our uh, US government published in the White House and Yes, and, and there's you a have European seen, directive that's come out as well. I, I have seen similar. the British, which is very I mean I, I have read it and I, I think there is a high level of maturity there in terms of AI implementation. So for us for me, my question is we're looking at Chat GPT and other products. We have a lot of products that are like Chat GPT. So in the Gen AI space, I, I think now with the, with the executive order, we need to step back and see exactly what we can and cannot do. I was wondering if you can tell us how is the British government handling Gen AI? I mean, there, is there like guardrail? Is there like maybe a RAG implementation that really is being proposed 
instead of just opening it to chat GPT or the open AI solutions? I mean, that would really help us a bit. Yeah, um, Thank you. I, I don't know that I can genuinely answer that question. Um, I think it's an evolving topic. Uh, I think the regulation around AI, in my mind, is going to be similar to the regulation around personal data was five, six years ago. And there will be um, governance put around it where the, the onus will be, I imagine, on enterprises to prove that they're using things in an ethical way. And so I think what I will say is around what we developed, always security and confidentiality was always top of mind. So I think that's one of, going to be one of the key features of whatever legislation comes along is making sure that you're in control of the information that you are processing through this kind of LLM technology. But beyond that, I'm really sorry. I, I should have prepared that, shouldn't I, coming to, to Washington, uh, <laughs> so, some kind of regulatory kind of... Go <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for the question, very thoughtful. We've got time for two more. There you go. go ahead. You mentioned localization as far as you know, users being able to upload documents, you know, to index and everything, um, to be able to run prompts against. Did you guys tackle you know security and everything across larger data sets and all, yeah. and how to see you know who could get access to what? So we're in the process of finalizing the solution to that, but I don't mind sharing how that works. So uh, at, at the base level, our data store is SharePoint. So that's the first thing. And what we wanted to make sure is that whatever system we use inherits the permissions of SharePoint. So that's the second thing to say. So um, Hebia is a system that will do that. Uh, Gaia is a system that will do that. Copilot is kind of a system that will do that. And it's less than straightforward. Uh, and again, I'll happily talk about that more in the bar later. Um, but then the key becomes this automating permissions to make sure that they are safe. So Veronis is a tool that um, automates the tagging of information, uh, analyzes permissions, analyzes actual access, and then comes up in an automated way with the safest possible way of looking at that data. So you can build custom rules like, for example, what things are under NDA, what things are PII, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how we're solving for that. We're in early testing, it looks pretty good. And I think the thing that's been really impressive about the Veronis tool is we have switched off links to literally hundreds of thousands of documents, and we've had four calls to the support desk, which I'll take that ratio any, any day. But yeah, thank you, so it's a really good question. Last one. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation and, and congrats as well. Uh, it's been really interesting and, and nicely told. Um, I got a question around accuracy uh, mm -hmm. because when we're building these kind of systems, uh, sometimes it's important to understand if the information we are bringing the system is bringing the response is accuracy or not, or maybe the system is made up some information, misunderstanding information. Are you planning about uh, um, uh, evolving the system with any kind of a scoring about how accuracy is the response or something like that? So um, we can't figure out how to make it go back. Um, on, the, on the prompt syntax slide, there was a bit around um, building your own internal vector database with your kind of corporate knowledge, corporate information. So that's one thing that we're doing. And we're also building personas inside of the tool. So it can say, as an HR person, and it gives you a specific uh, responses with respect to HR or as a finance person or, or that kind of thing. There are settings and parameters inside each of the LLMs that enable it to be more or less creative. If you're very worried about uh, accuracy, you want it less creative, obviously. So those are the things that you can play with. The more pre-processing and internal vector information that you have, the more accurate it will be. The less creative it will be, the more accurate it will be. I think those are the two key things. We're out of time. Thank you for finding your way all the way to Ballroom 11, I really appreciate it. Thank you to the guys at Raboyo and Appian. <laughs>